when you take facts that are so strongly supported by the data that even skeptical scholars are compelled to grant them as facts and just taking those facts alone, you're able to build a, a, a pretty robust case for the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and, and, and I look at that and say, that's all I need. So even if, if they didn't write the gospels, yeah, Jesus still rose from the dead. to the Maven Parent Podcast, and on this episode, we have a really special guest, more special than any guest <laughs> we've ever had in the history of this podcast. You're so mean. What? All the people who were guests before. Well, they've already they've already agreed to be on. They they were on, <laughs> and at that time, they were the most special guests. But they're in the rearview mi- mirror, and now we're looking to the most special <laughs> guest we've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> His name is Mike Lacona. Mike, thanks for being on the podcast. Oh, man, my pleasure, Brett. Thanks for asking me. Now, for those of you um, who who know of, gosh, Christian scholarship, which some people out there are thinking, is that an oxymoron? Do we actually have Christian scholarship? You you may be familiar with Mike's name. Mike Lacona is a, uh, a, a New Testament scholar, and um, he is uh, a PhD in New Testament. He's written a more than 700 page book on the evidence for the resurrection. His ministry is uh, Risen Jesus. And Mike is doing great work for the kingdom. And, uh, but a lot of our audience isn't in touch with that scholarship. So that is exactly why we're having Mike, Mike on our podcast today uh, to talk about uh, some of the uh, the important evidence that we have for the Christian faith. But before we get into all that stuff, Mike, we want you to give our listeners a little bit of background on you, who you are. Um, tell us about growing up. Did you grow up in a Christian home? When did you come to Christ? Mm-hmm. Give us a little uh, a context for your life. Well, I'm 62 years old. I was, oh, wait a second. Yeah. 62? You're 62? I'm 62. Wow. Yeah, Gosh. That's... Well, you're just a couple years older than Aaron. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, I, like 20, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I never, I, you know, it's weird to say I'm 62 because, you know, and you talk to people who are in their 80s and they say, you know, we don't feel in our heads any different than when we were in our 30s. And yeah. it's like, yeah. I don't feel like I'm 62. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't have guessed you were a day older than 60. So, oh. <laughs> I mean, so we're... Well, I appreciate that. You know, I remember the day after my 47th birthday, I was at that time working at the North American Mission Board, and uh, I took my birthday as a day off vacation day, came in the next day, and one of the VPs there said to me, so uh, it was your birthday yesterday. And I said, yeah. He said, well, happy birthday. How old are you? And I said, 47. He said, Wow, you don't look it. I said, thanks. He said, you used to. <laughs> uh, that sounds like someone I could be a friend with. Yeah. So. yeah. But but he, he got ripped up one point. Um, like he, he, he brought up a friend of mine, um, uh, and, and they were just kind of joking up there at this chapel service and about an event coming up. And my friend Thomas said, uh, Richard, um, they said the dress attire – is khaki, not tacky. <laughs> uh, okay, so you are 62. Six, you, you 62. lived 62 years of life. Yep. And uh, how did that all, all begin? Uh, it began... Well, okay. <laughs> just, I don't know that we want to talk about like that, that Not that far back. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, did you grow up in a Christian home, Mike? Uh, well, no and yes. So the first 10 years... No. So, um, all right. So my mom left my dad when I was five, right? Right. Like a couple of days before my fifth birthday. And, oh. and he was a jerk. He was from Honduras. That didn't make him a jerk, though. <laughs> but he was from Honduras. But the culture that he had was one where you just womanize. And mm-hmm. so I remember him saying to me one time, uh, how many, when, when I was single, he said, how many girls have you had sex with? And I said, none. And I'm waiting until I'm married. Oh, Mike. By the time I was your age, I'd had sex with 40 women. Um, so, But he cheated on my mom a lot. 
when they were married and beat her. You know, I, I remember him beating her. And uh, so I don't feel like I have scars from that. I don't know why. I just, mm -hmm. I don't. But she left him when I was five. And I can remember walking to church uh, with my mom in Baltimore City. And um, I remember asking her, I must have been around seven, eight at the time. And I said, hey, mom, how do I get to heaven? And she said, well, you just have to do more good than bad. Hmm. I said, oh, you know, I had a little sister three years older. I hit her, pulled her hair, made her cry. And I'm thinking, well, what if I do more bad than good? <laughs> well, then you go to hell to be with the devil forever. And I thought, well, where am I on that scale? Right? Mm -hmm. So um, she remarried uh, when I was 10. And uh, a little bit after that, we were going to a church. We moved out to Baltimore County, and they brought in a Christian magician or illusionist, whatever you want to call him. And they combined a bunch of our Sunday school classes for kids together. And he would do these magic tricks, but he would relate the gospel to them. Mm -hmm. And how I came to realize it wasn't this good versus bad. It's what Christ did for me. And um, he gave an invitation and I thought, this is exactly what I've been looking for. I've been looking to know. I mean, I want to know how to get to heaven. And uh, so at 10 years old, gave my life to Christ. Three of us went forward. I was thinking, I don't know why everybody else isn't, but I don't care. <laughs> I didn't care. Hmm. It's like, so that's the day I consider that I started my relationship with Christ. I got tricked into the kingdom, you know. <laughs> um, I grew some as a teen. So my dad and mom, they loved the Lord and were maturing as Christians and and they provided a good Christian home. Mm -hmm. So from 10 on up, I had a good Christian environment uh, to grow up in. And I ended up going to Liberty University. I was a music major, uh, played saxophone. I was planning on being a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, But my first year there, I felt like I don't want to do that. I want to do full-time Christian ministry. That's all I want to do. I want to devote my life to Christ. I want to do it. And uh, so, man, I just was growing in the Lord. And uh, by the time my senior year, I was probably reading scripture an hour a day. I was praying between an hour to two hours a day. Um, not that it was required. I just, I couldn't get enough of it. I felt like I had this intimate relationship with the Lord. So, um, you know, you guys have been to, uh, you know, theological training in school. Um, so you'll hear people talk about the Greek or the Hebrew and it, gives you know this kind of meaning behind it and so after a while i thought man this is just amazing i want to learn greek so i can read the new testament in its original language mm -hmm. and uh, so i did and uh, it's like you know you got to understand i was a gifted student in school you know when they gave me a c it was a gift <laughs> um, and and i have add um <clears throat> you know had it for as long as i could remember um but I loved Greek, mm. loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. They let me into pro, uh, to grad school on probation because my grades for undergrad wasn't, they weren't good. Mm. But I did so well on the Greek entrance exam that they said, okay, he's serious. Um, and so I took every Greek course that was offered and um, they even made up some independent studies for me like Septuagint Greek, rapid Greek reading, things like that. And I was just studying the New Testament in Greek for hundreds and hundreds of hours. And then one day I just asked myself the question, is this stuff really true? Anything that prompted that? No. No. Um, I'm you were this... just in your room thinking one day about it or and it's just like, thought. I feel I have this intimate relationship with God, but I got started thinking, well, do Muslims think the same thing? What about Hindus, Buddhists? I don't know. Could it be that I've tricked myself into thinking that I've got this intimate relationship with Lord, the Lord? Hmm. I, I don't know. How would I know? And I had a roommate. This was finishing up my grad my graduate degree in New Testament. And uh, my roommate was doing a master's degree in uh, philosophy and apologetics. And he said, you need to go see Gary Habermas. Knocked on his <laughs> door of his office and he invited me in and he said, I said, I'm having doubts about my Christian faith. He said, come on in, sit down. Close the door. He said, you know, don't worry about it. He said, I get students come in all the time with doubts. He said, I've had doubts. He said, what are you doubting? So we we talked. And um, 
So he shared with me the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And Which, by the way, for those who don't know who Gary Habermas is, he's a, a PhD uh, professor at the Liberty University and one of the foremost scholars. He is the foremost the foremost scholar on the evidence for the resurrection. So it's it's not like this is just kind of anybody. You're able to <laughs> go to somebody who has the the depth and the training and the knowledge to be able to help you walk through this kind of season of doubt that you're you're going through. Yeah, that's right. Um, and he I, didn't make he didn't mock you for it. He didn't. No. I I like his response. Like, oh yeah, I get students in here all the time, that right away would be disarming. Oh, okay, so I'm not alone in it. What a yeah. humble um, response to a student, especially because knowing who he is and he's thinking, oh, I, there's so much you don't know, but he didn't belittle you for that or, you no, know. You're, you're right. Yeah. And for some reason, Aaron, I don't know why, I've thought about it a couple of times, why didn't I go to any of my other professors? There was one in particular, my Greek professor who, one of the most influential per people in my life. I mean, godly man. Um, I don't know why I didn't go to him. I didn't feel comfortable. I don't know if it, I don't remember. Mm. Was it because I didn't want to let them down or was I embarrassed to go to them? Was it because Gary was a stranger? I, I don't mm. know. But yeah, he made me feel totally comfortable and even said he'd questioned. Um, so I walked out of there, you know, probably spent 25 minutes with him, felt pretty comfortable, reassured in my faith. After I finished my coursework in grad school, then I went, I just went out in the real world. And then, you know, I was sharing my faith with skeptics and they'd raise questions I had no idea how to answer. And then I started to have doubts again. Mm. And I call Gary. <laughs> there was no email back then. Mm -hmm. So I called, I'd call Gary and I'd really start, you know, questioning. I, I remember he calls it the famous Baltimore call and it was in 1989. And I remember calling him and I said, doc, you know, you know that a lot of people don't think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the gospels. And if they didn't wrote the gospels, how do we know who wrote them? If we don't know who wrote them, how do we know we can trust them? And this is really rocking my faith. He said, Mike, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? I said, yeah. He said, why do you believe that? I said, well, you know, you have this minimal facts approach, you call it, where you take facts that are so strongly supported by the data that even skeptical scholars are compelled to grant them as facts. And just taking those facts alone, you're able to build a, a, a pretty robust case for the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and, 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 I look at that and say, that's all I need. So even if if they didn't write the Gospels, yeah, Jesus still rose from the dead. Like we've got some evidence that they wrote the Gospels, but even if they didn't, you're right. Jesus still rose. If Jesus rose, is Christianity true? Yes. Well, then why are you allowing the authorship <laughs> of the Gospels to rock your faith? Ah, I think I see what you mean. Well, what do you do with all the alleged contradictions in the Gospels? I mean, Mike, did Jesus rise from the dead? Yes. Mike, you know, we've got a lot of uh, answers to these, but let's just say for the sake of argument that some of them are wrong. And let's say there are errors and contradictions in the Gospels. Did Jesus still rise from the dead? Yes. Why is that again? Minimal facts. Well, then, if Jesus rose, is Christianity true? Yes then why are you allowing gospel contradictions to bother you so much? Hmm. Ah. All right, Doc, I think I, I I see where you're going. But what do you do with the genocide text in the <laughs> Old Testament? Mike, did Jesus rise hmm. from the dead? That was a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. Because now it's like, no matter what the objection is, if Jesus rose, it's game, set, match. Christianity's true, period. And now I recognized from that point on, I could look at these things with an entirely open mind and come to my own conclusions, you know, after investigating it and do it with integrity. I didn't have to worry about Christianity being discredited because Jesus rose. So it's like, yeah. So that's how I got involved in apologetics. That's that's how it started. That's how it all started. Mm. 
Yeah, I love um, I love the recounting of that story because there, I mean, just several observations. Number one, Aaron kind of mentioned it is you had somebody in your life who wasn't afraid of your questions and didn't freak out over them. And I think that is really instructive to us, especially as Christian parents, as grandma and grandpa, you know, uh, or as a as an educator or a youth, youth pastor, pastor, whoever yeah. it is, to be able to to hear those questions even if it's coming from your own kid and not to flip out and, and just, just to relax and realize it's actually pretty, no, that's pretty normal. Um, and, it, and it's also an opportunity to then uh, take, take your kid deeper to, to help mm. provide the evidence. So don't look at it as necessarily a challenge, but a, an opportunity. Doubt can be an opportunity for growth. Mm. Uh, in someone's life. It can actually be this mo real motivating factor as it was in, in your life. And then to have someone who could help you think carefully through it. Okay, well, what is essential to make the case that Christianity is true? Do we need a, a Bible that's error-free? Do we need inerrancy, right? Do there, what doctrines are, are key for us to be able to say Christianity is true? And a lot of a Christian adult can't even think carefully through that or just have no clue. And they think, oh, gosh, if if there are errors in the Bible, then, you know, this would upset the whole thing. And you, you think about it for a second. First century, you had thousands of people become Christians before the New Testament was written, before any of the Gospels were written. Mm -hmm. So if Christianity is not true because there are contradictions in the Gospels, what do you do with Christianity before the Gospels? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, so you had someone who could kind of wisely guide you guide you through that. Yeah. And you know what? So, something you said, and I agree with you 100% on it, is um, you know, we don't have to run from this stuff. In fact, it's bad if we do. Yeah. Because you know, there are people out there who would say, you know, don't ask those questions. No, ask those questions. And it and if you if you tell someone you're not to ask those questions, then that communicates to them, well, you don't have answers to them. Mm -hmm. There aren't any answers to them. Um, maybe these doubts are something I should be entertaining even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you shut down the questions, and we, Aaron and I talk about this all the time on the podcast, if you shut down the questions, your kids don't stop asking the questions. They just stop asking you the questions Ooh. and they move on to someone else. They or they Google it, right? Or they go to Siri. They go to their smartphone. They go to their friends. They go to YouTube. They'll go to all kinds of other sources. Mm -hmm. And so you want to calmly field those questions. And when you don't know the answer, you say, "I don't know." That's a really good question. Let me look up some resources. Let me find some, uh, you know, some books or some articles or some videos out there that will help us. And let's let's go through this together. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's. It's so important that we we create that space where the we want our kids doubting with us, mm -hmm. not away from us. Mm -hmm. So thinking about, I'm thinking about how Dr. Habermas, that approach he took with you of bringing you back to what you knew was true, had good reasons to believe was true. And so it's it sounds like everything hinges on the resurrection. And, and that's kind of what we want to get to with you and, and thinking about how we talk about Christianity with our kids, how we present it to them, what we present to them are some of the real basic things that um, are fundamental to it. But is that when, so after that interaction, is that when you thought, okay, now my ministry is really going to be focused on the resurrection, because you were talking to people, you were evangelizing, you were doing things. And just now I know where, I know the ending point with Mike. So I'm thinking, is that when, for you, did that kind of clarify, this is something I want to get good at or get really a lot of knowledge in so that I can help other Christians, you know, be a better uh, witness for Christ? What was kind of... Did that help kind of clarify yeah. even your career or in yeah, like where you wanted to go? That's a good question and certainly better than the ones that Brett has asked so far. <laughs> well, that's why I have her on the podcast. <laughs> Actually, it um, no. Hmm. 
Mm. It didn't. It just made me more comfortable with my faith at that point. Mm. But I, I was, when I started in apologetics, I was more interested in the science stuff, to be honest mm. with you. Mm. And the historical stuff, I, I wasn't that interested in. Mm. Um, I, I guess I started to get interested in resurrection. It would have been 1997. And um, I was lecturing on it to a, an adult Sunday school class at my church. Um, and um, I'd gone through a couple of weeks of different things on apologetics. And I came to the last part, and that was on the resurrection. And, you know, you guys speak in front of people. You know when you're connecting with the crowd. You know when you're not connecting. And I was not connecting. I've never had that experience. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. Wow. I believe, I Tell me more it. about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like I, I was so discouraged afterward. And I remember riding home after church. And my wife said, what's wrong? I said, I'm just a loser. I said, I wasn't connecting with these people. I was boring. And um, I just gave them dry facts. And it's like, this is the resurrection of Jesus. This should be exciting stuff. And she says, well, um, I don't know. Why don't you just video record you giving a lecture and make that available to people? I said, why? So they can be even more bored watching me on video than in person? And she said, well, why don't you make a movie or something? I said, a movie? I have no, <laughs> how am I going to make a movie? You no, know, that's going to, that's money, m -m 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 money. <laughs> and it's like, um, well, why don't you write a script to, to something and just start on some? So I thought, you know what? I could do that. I don't know if it'd ever get anywhere. So I got home after lunch and I got thinking, what could I do for a movie? If I were going to do a movie. Or write a book, a, thick, a, a, a book. So I thought, why don't I do something like, you know, with the Scopes trial, but instead do it with the resurrection? Something that ended up being like you found in uh, God is Not Dead, part two. Mm -hmm. Only this was 1997, a few decades before that movie came out. And um, so I thought, I'll do that. I'll have a professor who's teaching a class on religion, student says something about resurrection. Well, if resurrection happened, what's that mean about other religions? Is it false? Yes. And the student complains, the professor gets fired, and, and then um, the professor takes the school to court. And so I end up like doing this. And the, I self-published a book, it was called cross-examined <laughs> in 1998 no way. years before frank came out with that name for his ministry so frank still hasn't paid me for that name yet but um, yeah, that he guy, owes you that guy is slimy I, you know, <laughs> oh I mean, my god just, well don't tell him we said this but, uh, <laughs> no that's 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 incredible yeah the only people who hear you just just us just us in this and room. and whatever mm -hmm. thousands of people but they won't tell him <laughs> no nobody will no say don't don't tell frank you said that okay <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the really good part about that book, it only sold like 2,000 copies. I mean, but, you know, I did it when I was lecturing, self-published and everything. Um, and it got made into a church play that was done down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Okay. And D. James Kennedy's right-hand man came to that. This was like 2004. Came to it. We sat next to it. He said, Man, Mike, this needs to be made into a movie. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. So I ran it by like, a couple of places. Nobody was interested in it. But um, the good part about that book was that it really made me think creatively on how to share the evidence for the resurrection mm. in an entertaining manner. Because as I'm going through the different interactions between the prosecuting attorney, the defense attorney, the witnesses, and you come up with creative ways, humor, illustrations. It's like, ah, I can use this. And all of a sudden, my public speaking, I started getting asked a lot because I became a better public speaker as a result of that. Yeah. And that's what got me interested, really interested in the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because I remember as I'm going through these things, I'm trying to think as the press or the defense attorney, 
Yeah, the defense attorney would be the school for representing the school, actually, right? Because the professor is suing the school. Um, I, I'm trying to think like the defense attorney, how can I poke holes in this case for the resurrection of Jesus? And I'm really trying to do it. And I'm trying to come up with, with, with better things than what I'm used to hearing. And then I start to doubt. <laughs> hey, uh, Gary, Doc, how would you answer this? <laughs> and I'd call him, you know, and, and it's like, so I really wrestled through it. It really um, helped me uh, take my um, knowledge of the resurrection to the next step. And I'll throw in one more thing. Um, then the year 2000 came along. And there was going to be this mock court, mock court uh, in Virginia Beach at Regent University in the law school. And um, they brought in some people. Uh, Jay Sekulow uh, was involved in this, and they brought some others in. And it was like presenting the case for the resurrection before the court. And they asked me to do the brief for it. So I did all this research more, more research mm -hmm. to come up with a case for the resurrection. And that formed a lot of what's in this mm. book. Yeah. And, uh, and so for those who are watching on the YouTube channel, you can see the cover here. But uh, Mike co-authored a book with Gary Habermas, who we've been talking about, called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. And this is a great book. It's, uh, we'd say it's, it's um, a really accessible book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys tried to to pitch this at a level that your um... even a Southern Baptist could understand. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Ouch! Well, Mike. there goes the three Southern Baptists who are listening anyway. Um, yeah, I worked for them for seven years. I mean, I'm entitled to joke like that. <laughs> Absolutely, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. Okay. Um, and I've got a whole lot. You know, I just got a whole lot of Southern Baptist jokes, jokes. that I just want to. You know, nope. but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron will check that. Uh, but no, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus is a great book. This is a book that um, anytime I will do like a popular level talk for students on the resurrection, I actually put I put your and Gary's faces up oh. and point them to this mm -hmm. as the resource to get. This is the, the one resource I give to uh, audiences to say, hey, okay, start here, and this will give you plenty of um, uh, lay out the evidence in a clear way that will give you confidence for your own views, but also give you the kind of tools you need to engage the skeptics. So have we you would played the game in the back. I have not. So there is a DV or a, a, a compact disc, a CD in the back yeah. here, and I have not ever played the game. Oh, you're kidding. Okay. So unfortunately, it's for PC only. It won't work on a Mac. Oh, maybe that's why I've never played. We it. had a company. <laughs> I, I think that this game, it's a game, and it takes this book, it raises the bar to a level that wasn't there previously. I don't even think it's been, I don't think another book has met the bar of this for a lay-level book as like a self-study course. We had a company that uh, made tank simulators. They were a defense contractor. They made it for the Department of Defense, tank simulators. And I spoke at a church up in uh, Northern Virginia. And this guy comes up and he says, I really like uh, the idea, because I, I had this idea about making a, a, a program to help you master the information book. He said, um, I'd like to volunteer our company to do that for you. They put in over a quarter million dollars worth of labor to create that game. What? It is a simulated television game show with an animated game show host who's hilarious. And it will help you master the information in the book. That's mm. that's crazy. Yeah, it's it's fun. It is a fun game to play. But it only works on a PC. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, so we're gonna have to hunt down a PC. Um, <laughs> in fact, I don't I, know if I even have friends who have PCs anymore. <laughs> that company did so well that it was done on. Um, I think Macromedia Director is how they created it. And in order to get it approved, you actually had to send it off to Macromedia to get their permission at the end. To, so we had to do that. And they were like, we didn't know our program would do this. Oh, wow. So this would be, That's I mean, so this is a great tool for, for parents. Oh, absolutely. Because you've got this interactive thing. Okay, we got to figure out, Mike, how to get this online. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. I don't know how to do it. 
You there's there's got to be a way, Micah. We got let's look into that. There's got to be a way <laughs> Micah, you have that we could put this tool online so that when someone buys the book, they don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, CDs they're out. Yeah, I mean, you know, I no one uses. Know I mean, we use it. we throw CDs at each other now. But I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, we got to let's 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 figure that out. We gotta we gotta we gotta bring Micah in. That's the, pretty funny. I've had five year olds play it, and they'll just sit there play it and laugh because it, I'm not gonna give anything away because it. Of what what the game is, but it's it's fun. Okay. It's fun to play. If you take too long to answer, the game show host gets on you, oh. and we'll do all kinds of. Well, stuff. I'm glad you mentioned that kids can play it too, because wow, yeah. five year old. So, uh, I just I just love hearing your story, Mike, and and even how God has pushed you to be creative in your scholarly study and then creative to reach people for this important knowledge that as Christians we need. And and I want to make that connection for people because I think sometimes when we grow up in the church or we've been in the church for a while, we have heard about Jesus's resurrection over and over again, and it becomes this like, oh yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. And we don't take it as seriously as Dr. Habermas kept reminding you of. Mm. And so I I want you to kind of thread that needle for for people, for parents of why, why we need to take seriously the study of the resurrection. And especially as parents who, you know, as as we've raised our kids. You you feel this heavy burden, and you're a dad too, which we we forgot to mention in the introduction. But Mike has Mike and his wonderful wife have two kids, adult kids now. Mm-hmm. But you know this this weight of if you do take your faith seriously, if you think Christianity is true, which we do, then you want your kids to grow up with the knowledge of this truth and to follow Christ. And so this feeling of how do I pass this on? How do I teach it to my kids? That was something for me, especially when our oldest daughter was little, I was like, I don't know how to do this. Because I did grow up in a Christian home and we went to church on Sunday, but I just didn't see how anything at church had anything to do with regular life. And yeah, I mean, I, I remember hearing you know, Jesus died for your sins. And I remember thinking as a kid, why? Like that makes, it just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And, you know, I think now reading like Francis Schaeffer, who talks about why we don't start the gospel with Jesus died, you start before that to make sense of the whole story. So I'm going on and on. But so, so why should we as Christians spend time thinking about reading the case for the resurrection and, and looking at the evidence and looking it. at the evidence and and really thinking about oh this actually our faith kind of hinges on this this isn't a matter of just like oh the buddhists believe one thing the mormons believe one thing we believe this you know little thing that Jesus came and he died and then he rose again. Um, but actually, it's our faith hinges on it. Like Paul talks about that. If it's not true, this whole thing's a joke. Mm-hmm. And we, we're we kind of, people should feel sorry for us because mm-hmm. we believe this crazy thing. And Paul hinges it on the resurrection. So, well, maybe maybe we could start with, how did you teach your kids about the resurrection? I mean, how were you in were you still getting your PhD at this time when you were having kids? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have to uh, you know, I'll freely admit I, I kind of failed in this way. Um, what I didn't want to do since my kids were growing up in a home where they knew their mom and dad loved God more than anything else. We didn't want to make the mistake of of trying to like force things on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we kind of um, 
trusted that the youth leaders were going to instill a lot of the stuff in them and even mm -hmm. teach some apologetics. Um, they didn't. <laughs> they did more just, you know, playing ping pong and watch movies and things like that. So we passed the baton to them and they dropped it. And but that all comes back on me. It was all that comes fear? It's ultimately, huh? Was that were you, what, what was underneath that for you? Was wanna, it fear or I didn't want to force it? it. My my okay. dad was kind of like, I mean, he was a he's a good guy. Um but I I kind of felt like religion, even though I was growing during my teens, it, it's like we just heard it so much, we got kind of tired of it. Um, I didn't want to make that mistake with my kids. Okay. So I went too far in the other direction. Mm. And then when I was doing my PhD, I'm working a full-time job. I'm on the road 130 to 140 days a year at that time. Mm. And I'm doing my, my doctoral research. And I did it that way for five and a half years. Um, so I didn't spend as much time with my kids as I should have. And um, so I, I regret that. Now, there, there's also a part that's like, uh, would you do it differently? Yeah, I would do it a little bit differently. I would have spent some more time with my kids. Um, but I, I can tell, you know, Brett is a much better dad than I ever was or that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I beat myself up for that some, but not a whole lot. And the reason I say that is because, you know, Jesus did say, um, unless you love me more, right, mm -hmm. than wife and mother and father and children, brothers and sisters, you cannot be my disciple. I, I don't know that the apostles, oh, Jesus, I can't go out on that trip. It's my son's birthday. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm sure their kids and their spouses felt neglected some. Um, so I don't know where the balance, the mm. line is. Maybe it's different for, for mm. everyone. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, we, we, so in terms of, uh, I'm just thinking of a Christian parent listening out there. Okay, so we... We've got this scholar on the resurrection, but what about the Christian parents, the Christian families out there? You're kind of normal, quote unquote, normal average Christian out there who says, well, okay, yeah, for the scholar, that's great, all this evidence for the resurrection, but really isn't just my belief enough, right? I, I believe in the resurrection, that's it. I'm gonna tell my kids, hey, believe in the resurrection, the Bible says so kind of thing. Why? Is that enough, Mike? Uh, or why Why should they know the evidence? Why should they talk about the evidence and pass that on to their kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I think it depends on the person. So like my dad, he didn't have any use for apologetics. Um, he was a diehard Calvinist. And if the Holy Spirit has told you mm -hmm. that Christianity is true, by golly, you never doubt, you know, <laughs> and the fact that I doubt it, you know, at that time and even after then, um, that was a sore spot, you know, with, with him. He didn't mm. like the fact that that is how I'm wired. Well, that's, that's how, how caus God causally determined you on his view. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I wish I knew you then. That would have been a great answer to give him, right? Um so I love I love my Calvinist friends. I think I do think they're going to heaven still. So oh my god. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think I lost my train of thought here. Um, your your, your dad, dad was wired so different than yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. So he mm -hmm. never doubted. He has never once doubted. I've talked to Bill Craig. Bill Craig has never once doubted his Christian faith. And for those who don't know, Bill Craig, William Lane Craig, one of the foremost. Uh, I think apologist. he's the greatest Christian apologist in the history of the church. Hmm. I mean, he's he's in a higher league. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? He's 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 amazing. Yeah, yeah. And he's there's another name. Uh, you, I, I want parents to know Mike Lacona. I want parents to know <laughs> Gary Habermas. I want parents to know William Lane Craig. These are men who have given evidence for the Christian faith. So so what okay, would you so, say to the parent who says, "Well, beliefs yeah. enough"? So, so for some people, it is going to be enough. Hmm. 
But there are a lot of us, like me, and it's not enough. I need facts. And so you need to understand we're all wired differently. Some mm -hmm. people are going to doubt. They don't need the evidence. Some people, like myself, are going to doubt. We need evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, C.S. Lewis doubted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just Christians. Even uh, Anthony Flew, the, perhaps the most influential philosophical atheist of the latter part of the 20th century, latter half of the 20th century, said he doubted his atheism all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, he ended up believing coming to believe that God exists, but he didn't become a Christian. Um, but a lot of us can, can and C.S. Lewis said when he was an atheist, he doubted mm -hmm. that there were times when Christianity looked a, a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. So I, here's why I think it, whether you doubt or not, or, or don't ever doubt, I think it's important to know the evidence. Here's why. We live in an upside down world now, don't we? Yeah. I mean, our world is insane. Mm -hmm. What's going on? And I truly think that we as Christians are going to see some, some real persecution in the coming years. Yes, here in the US, I think we're gonna see it. I think we're gonna see it in Europe. I think we're gonna see it around the world. We are no longer in a majority. People may claim to be Christian, but they're not really. You know, mm. The true elect, um, <laughs> I'm not Calvinist, but I do like to use it. The true followers of Jesus um, are, are going to be persecuted, I think, in the future. And, and here's why the evidence is important. When you're about ready and you either have to stand up for Christ or you're going to lose your house or your job or you're going to jail, um, what are you going to do? Um, if you are just playing with Christianity. It's like, eh, you know, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to give. Yeah, I believe it, but, you know, I don't believe it enough to give up and lose my job. Mm. I don't, I, or to go to prison. Um, no, you know, well, when it comes down to it, how do I know Christianity is true? Don't people of other, back to my initial doubts, don't people of other beliefs think that theirs is true? The reason we can know Christianity is true is because Jesus rose from the dead. How come we can know Jesus rose from the dead? Because there's superb evidence for it. We don't have that for Islam. We don't have that for Hinduism. Mm -hmm. We don't have that for Buddhism. We do have. We don't. Uh, it. We don't have it for other religions. We have it for Christianity, mm -hmm. that He rose from the dead. And so, when the rubber meets the road and persecution hits, um, and like I said, I'm 62. I, I think I may see it before I die. Um, it, it's a good time to be in your 80s right now. I think, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think there's a good chance I'm going to see it before I die. I think there's an excellent chance you're going to see it. I think it's certain that our kids are going to see it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important for them to know the evidence so that they know Christianity is true. So when they are faced with the rubber beat in the road. And they're gonna and and they're gonna lose something as a result of their faith, then they know it's true, and it's like, hey, my citizenship's in heaven. I mean, this isn't the stuff that people in Hong Kong are facing right now, mm -hmm. with the Chinese government saying, you make the Chinese Communist Party number one above everything, mm -hmm. or else, yeah, you know, if you even put Christ first, you go to prison for the rest of your life. These people have been free their whole life, and now they're faced with this kind of a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Woo. Yeah, and and that's where I think when we when we think about belief, if we if we say, well, it's just it's enough that we believe. Well, but even with belief, there are there are degrees of strength when it comes to our beliefs. There's some beliefs that I hold, eh, maybe more 50-50, you know, or uh, maybe it's sixty forty or whatever. Um, and, and you know those those beliefs that you're you're more 50 50 60 40 they don't uh they might not play as big of a role in your life or you might not be willing to drop everything for that belief mm -hmm. uh and so you know i think we want to kind of talk to our kids and kind of get a a pulse for okay how strongly do you believe this how strongly do you believe that jesus rose from the dead mm -hmm. you know and is and and it's it's not enough that mom and dad told you the bible said so we, you know, and and to kind of have that kind of dialogue with our kids, but also to think about the strengthening of our kids' beliefs, so that when 
the persecution comes. When there is the there is the external pressure, those beliefs are well anchored, mm-hmm. and you know someone you you know, I want my kids to be ninety five five. You know where mm-hmm. there's a strong conviction like no. I don't just believe this. I know this is true. I know Jesus rose from the dead, right? And it's the reasons and the justification and the evidence that really strengthen our convictions that then cause us to really live our lives uh, on kind of the rails of of our beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, When you were talking, Mike, I thought about, I think it's in Book of John, but when, you know, Jesus is starting to get more into his teachings and really starting to uh his listener his followers were starting to think okay now he's starting to say some weird stuff like the in the mm-hmm. part he's talking about you're you're gonna yeah. if you follow me you're gonna drink my blood and eat my flesh and so people start to leave now what and, if brett had said that to you when you were <laughs> <laughs> she did ask i would me have left her heart, uh, when we first i met. absolutely did not but <laughs> You know, that's a scene where people are leaving. And then Jesus turns to the disciples and he says, you know, are you going to leave too? And Peter, in particular, who we know later, doubts, goes through doubt. But then we know later on is killed for his faith. Mm-hmm. But Peter answers, he he's like, where else would I go? But part of that answer was because he had seen Jesus. He had seen so much evidence that Jesus was actually the promised Messiah. He was here. And so it was like the the evidence was too overwhelming that even though, you know, people are starting to leave, Peter's like, where am I going to go? And then it also made me think too, I think because you mentioned persecution, which I do think we have to talk to our kids about. So on All Saints Day, I read to our younger kids the story of Polycarp. Mm. And mm. of course, he was a disciple of John. Mm-hmm. And he, when he was ended up being burned at the stake, he would not renounce Christ. And, and part of it was like, I can't renounce Christ. I know that he lived, died, and rose again. Like, I can't. I can't walk away. I can't deny it. And it was this overwhelming knowledge that he had that this life wasn't all there is, that there was much more to come. And I think, you know, that we do have to tell these stories to our kids because I think more than social persecution is coming. Mm-hmm. And and so it is important that we present to them a faith that isn't just good feelings. Jesus is going to make your life happy. Jesus is going to actually ask a lot from you, but it's true. And he really lived and he really died. And and we have good reason to believe which, he rose again. Yeah, which we haven't even touched on any of the I evidence know. yet. So that's <laughs> so. where I was, I was thinking, should we have Mike say maybe just to... Wet people's appetite for oh yeah why okay so that's yeah, yeah. Where, that's where I was going I, well I was leading you there I was oh, transitioning were you, you. Were you yeah there? <laughs> um, so Mike you've read I mean you've written a seven hundred page book on this right uh, I'm I'm guessing that most of our audience is not going to read that book um, so but they but they should we get it. we should. T- it should be a resource in well, your home yeah and a couple a couple of thoughts on that like number one even if you don't read that book. Even to get that book and have it on your shelf. It looks impressive. And <laughs> it's a number one gonna make you look smart. Number two, but it, there's there is this uh almost it, it, this is where I think in in the kind of the modern evangelical church, we need to we need to think about the importance of Christian scholarship and the fact that we have guys like you on our team who we can count on to be doing some of that hard work of scholarship that maybe the, you know, the mom or dad who are, uh, you know, the businessman or woman there or, or homemaker, whoever, they they actually can, in a sense, r- lean on you and rely upon you and know, hey, I mean, it's just helpful to know that, hey, there's this guy on our side 
who's a legitimate PhD, uh, a major scholar, and he has written this massive tome on the evidence for the resurrection. Okay, so and so there's this kind of borrowing of your faith in a sense, right? Where we can kind of lean on you and to be able to point to our kids and to say, hey, especially for those who have like maybe kids that are a little more intellectual or who, who are more skeptical or who are doubting to say, hey, here, here's a 700 page volume on the historical evidence for the resurrection. So there's that aspect of it. But you've also given us a more accessible work in the case of the resurrection of Jesus. But just lay out for us, maybe for, for parents, so kind of your ordinary mom and dad out there who don't, they don't have scholarship background, but what, what would you say to them in terms of, hey, here's some of the evidence you want to point your kids to for the historical resurrection of Jesus? Um, yeah, well, pretty simple. Uh, and that's in this book. Um, so you just have to start off with one fact, and that is the disciples were claiming Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them. That's all you really need to start with. You don't even have to show that they believed it. You don't have to show that Jesus rose or that they even believed it. You just have to show that they claimed it. So that's just a really modest, real modest, real modest statement right there. Yep. These guys in the first century claimed that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. Right. How do we know that? Well, Gary and I, in our book, we have the acronym POW, P-O-W. P stands for Paul. So you've got Paul, and in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, he gives the gospel message, and then he, which he gives an outline, the death, burial, resurrection, and resurrection appearances of Jesus. And then... In um, verse 11, he says, whether I or they, the other apostles, this is what we preached and this is what you believed. Okay? So he's saying not only he as an apostle has seen Jesus and preaching it, but he says the other apostles saw Jesus and they're preaching it. And he, sa and, um, he says, I delivered to you, in verse 3, what I also received. And he got it from the apostles. So we know from Paul, He's getting this from the apostles. We know that Paul and the apostles are, are, are preaching this. And in Galatians chapter 1, uh, uh, he says he spent 15 days with Peter. And in chapter 2, he ran the gospel message past Peter, James, and John. So you got two of Jesus' three closest disciples, Peter and John, and then James, Jesus' brother. That's pretty good. And he said, I ran the gospel message past them that I'd been preaching to ensure that I was on message with what they're preaching. And he said, they added nothing to what I said. They extended the right hand of fellowship. In other words, fist bump, Paul. <laughs> good job, brother. Keep up the good work. So Paul's preaching the same thing they're preaching. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, he's preaching the death, burial, resurrection, appearances of Jesus. And that whether I or they, the other apostles, this was what we preached. So number one, P, Paul. O, oral tradition. Now we got oral tradition. Go back to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15. Again, I deliver to you what I also received. This is oral tradition. And he's talking about, he, he got it from, he said, then Jesus appeared to Peter, then to the 12, then to more than 500, then to James. Wait a minute. Uh, Paul met with Peter and James twice. That's where he's getting this information from. Mm -hmm. Then to all the apostles, and then Paul adds his own name to the list. So you got oral tradition plus um, you have the sermon summaries in the book of Acts, about a third of all of Acts, maybe even a little bit more, are either direct or indirect speeches and sermons. And so scholars like differ on their opinions of what these sermons are, but at minimum, they agree that these sermons encapsulate the apostolic message that's going on. So they'll debate on whether... I mean, some will say, yeah, Peter gave that message on that uh, on that occasion. Others will say, no, he didn't. But the message the apostles were preaching, you know, yeah, that's in that sermon. So, um, so you got the the Acts sermon summaries, um, and then you've got, and that's like oral tradition, and then you got written tradition. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you have Clement of Rome, who is believed probably to have been a disciple of the Apostle Peter. And then you have Polycarp. One of you mentioned Polycarp. Um, 
It was probably a disciple of, of John. And they both mention the resurrection of Jesus. So that's pretty cool stuff. So you've got Paul, oral tradition, and written tradition. I mean, in all there, you got Paul, then oral tradition, you got the Creed in 1 Corinthians 15 and sermon summaries. You got written tradition, four gospels, and then Clement of Rome and Polycarp. That's nine sources, hmm. uh, nine first century sources that all point to the apostles claiming Jesus rose and appeared to them. So, I mean, this is pretty much an, a non-disputed fact that the disciples were claiming that. And that's how you start. That's the main thing. And, and this is even amongst non-Christian scholars. That's right. They would say. They're, they're not going to dispute that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, well, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? Well, there are only so many options. You know, um, Were they lying? Well, then you can show... No, because, you know, probably not because we got many testimonies, even from the first century, that these disciples were willing to suffer continuously, willing to die, and even several of them did die as martyrs. Uh, Sean McDowell, probably the leading authority on that, you know, with his, his doctoral dissertation and work on what happened to the apostles. Um, so, what, uh, okay. It wasn't a lie. They they truly believed it. And by the way, just about every scholar will say that too. They not only claimed it, they also believed it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's true that a lot of the later accounts of the disciples dying were probably fabricated or amplified from what they really were. Um, even Polycarp's death was probably amplified a little bit mm -hmm. because, yeah, he was burned at the stake, but then it said, you know, he wasn't being consumed. And so the soldier pierced him with a sword, and when he pulled it out, so much blood came out of Polycarp that it extinguished the fire, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, in Jewish martyrdom literature, there's a lot of amplification embellishment in it as well. So there's probably some, some of that going on. So how much of it is trustworthy? We don't know. They may have all died as martyrs. Maybe not. We don't know. We do know Peter. We do know Paul. We do know James, the brother of Jesus, um, at least those three, at the very minimum, those three are, are pretty much beyond doubt. So they truly believed it. And then you got to look at other things like hallucinations or were they using it as a metaphor, things like that. And there are all these other kind. And these are other explanations people other are going to give. Yeah. And we talk in the book how to address those. Yeah. And, um, you know, so that's the thing right there. You start off with, Jesus' disciples claimed he rose and appeared to them. That's it. And you get that, you are home free. Yeah. The rest of it is a piece of cake. Yeah. And I love that. I've seen you kind of sketch out a little chart that I think is really helpful. Oh, yeah. You start with that, that fact. Okay, the, at the very least, these guys believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And then you got two options. Either he did rise or he didn't rise, you know? And now if they believed it and he didn't rise, then you're left with, you know, a couple, a couple of other options, right? Um, they knew that he didn't rise. Well, it's like, okay, so he either appeared or he didn't appear. If he didn't appear, they really thought he appeared or they knew he didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they thought he did, they were either hallucinating or Jesus had an identical twin, you yeah. know, <laughs> and, things, and you go through all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's uh, something I've added recently. I don't think that's in the book. But that's a, a lecture I've, I started to give more this year. And I say, you know, here's a way to share the evidence for the resurrection. It's so simple. You can share it on a napkin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And you can draw uh, it out. And you could probably find that. I'm sure there's uh, some of that's on YouTube. You could search for uh, Mike Lycona's name on YouTube. And there's all kinds of talks that you've done. Uh, there's this book. There is, uh, I mean, you've done um, seven different books, right? Or are you on... Eight or nine. I'm aware you lose track. With I don't know what about you. Eight or nine is what I'm at. I think no. I've got another one coming out in May. I don't know which one that is. Yeah, well, tell people where they can they can find you at Mike in your website. Uh, RisenJesus.com is my website. Um, we also have a YouTube channel. There's over 500 videos on there. Uh, just type in my name, Mike Lacona, and that channel will come up on YouTube. Um, it can also, you know, this wouldn't be for young kids here, but if you have adults um, um, who are interested in going deeper in apologetics, I teach at Houston Christian University. Mm -hmm. We have certificate programs there, and we also have a master's degree in uh, Christian apologetics. 
great faculty. Um, people can do it entirely online. Yeah, and you and even if you can't pull off the a full degree, you can audit classes. Oh yeah, online. I just saw uh, Nancy Piercy post something yeah. about that, and so great resources. Yeah, Piercy's there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, she's great. Really, really People good love folks her. there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Mike, this has been a great conversation. I mean, yeah. it's just been real personal to hear kind of your own personal journey. Uh, uh, your the, the doubt that you struggled with, you, your, some of your parenting struggles, your scholarship, mm -hmm. and everything in between. So. Yeah, I I have loved hearing your story, Mike, because I think just as a mom and as the parents listening, you know, you you have no we have no idea what we're preparing our kids for, what kind of life they're going to lead, and I just think about little five year old Mike walking to church with <laughs> your mom. Your mom probably just thinking, you know, her marriage just fell apart and, and, but God was with you and God was with her. And it's just, it makes me just love and wonder at God, just hearing your story because little Mike, he took and watched over you and made you the way you are. And, and even I think it's encouraging for parents to hear. And I love how honest you were about like you having ADD and not getting some C's in school. And sometimes things like this happen with our kids and we think, oh no, they're going to struggle the rest of their lives. Or, oh no, this is, this is the worst thing. I thought they would do this and now they, they won't be able. Your mom had no idea what God was going to do in your life. And it's always, I think, just encouraging to hear people's yeah. story. And we love that you are a brother in Christ on our side, working for um, the cause of Christ and spreading the gospel. And um, so thank you for being with us and for being so honest and sharing with us. Yeah, and I think helping us to see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I mean, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith is in vain. This whole thing is useless, it's, it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And what you've done is you've served the church well, you've served Christian families well by laying out the powerful case that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Because there's a flip side. Hey, if this stuff is not true, then yeah, it's a waste of time, it's futile. But if it is true, right, it changes everything. So mm -hmm. thanks, Mike. Well, thanks for having me. I, I love your ministry and it's so mm -hmm. important. And I've just I'm blown away in how the Lord has blessed your ministry. And mm -hmm. I remember when you started Maven, and it's just, I can't believe the way it's just exploded in growth. God is with you guys. Mm -hmm. And you. it's just an honor to be on the same team. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.